Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong and welcome to Cracking Addiction. We have with us Dr. Manu Bhatnagar. Manu, I thought today we'd talk about the non-stimulant treatment of ADHD when we're thinking purely about the pharmacology. And I suppose really I just want to follow on from the previous episode and recap on this idea of the inverted pyramid in terms of in terms of reuptake inhibition. So we've got cocaine and amphetamines, which uh, inhibit the reuptake of all the three main monoamines, serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Then we've got uh, the stimulant methylphenidate, which inhibits the reuptake of noradrenaline and dopamine. And then we've got atomoxetine, which is a NIRI, as you say, which is a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Um, but that's not the whole story, because we have this other range of drugs which are non-stimulants. So I'm thinking particularly of uh, clonidine and guanfazine. So tell me about tell me about uh, the role of clonidine and guanfazine in ADHD. Well, I use clonidine relatively often. Um, mm. Clonidine is uh, not by any means psychotropic medication when it was first invented, um, and it's about lowering uh, blood pressure and the added side effect of clonidine when you're trying to lower someone's blood pressure is that they start sleeping really well. Um, and mm. insomnia seems to be a very common uh, symptom that's maybe not in the DSM criteria for ADHD, but definitely within that syndrome of someone who's neurodiverse mm. and experiencing inattention as a result of ADHD. Yeah. And, and the hypothesis yeah. of that may be that um, if you're not really spending a lot of focus on particular things throughout the day. Um, maybe you're not exerting yourself from a cognitive sense throughout the day and um, you need to sort of have a bit more time at the end of the day to do more things until you get more tired. And there's also that very strong underpinning link to ADHD and delayed sleep phase disorder. Yes, I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, delayed sleep phase is the, is the curse of being an adolescent. On a, but... In ADHD, it's even more exacerbated, both because they've got ADHD and also because they're taking stimulants. Yeah, yeah. Could you yeah. comment on that? It's it's one thing that, um, you know, as a society in, in Scandinavia, if you uh, are a high school student, you get to go to school at 10 a.m. and finish at 6 p.m., which means you take your stimulant medication at 9.30 so that you have your natural waking day um, where you have yeah. stimulants uh, and for teenagers we're waking them up at six o'clock to take their ritalin so that they can get ready for school which starts at eight thirty, and their natural sleep cycle is completely out of whack to begin with it's just gets, getting confused yeah. even more so that, that's where saying to someone you need to take stimulants isn't enough um and yeah. having multimodal approach yeah. all of the different facets of adhd is really vital and that could be yeah. um you know focusing on what time to take their stimulants, but also making sure that they get good sleep. So clonidine yeah. is really effective for um, that sort of mild level of unwinding and anti-agitation as opposed to a hypnotic drug, which will just uh, knock you out and not allow you to enter the full stages of uh, your sleep architecture. Clonidine, the hypothesis is it's um, a vasodilator and it, uh, sort of reverse engineers relaxation by vasodilating just before you're about to go go to bed, and that causes you to basically unwind and relax enough that the normal sleep processes can take over. Um, and for someone who's quite hyperactive and impulsive, that's really vital to, to get to bed at a reasonable time. Um, some mm. do take it earlier on just to kind of take the edge off from the hyperactivity component, but predominantly clonidine is used as an augment um, for night time at about 100 or 200 micrograms, um, and people get wonderful results. Even if you don't have ADHD, some people can find yeah. it. But the rights just... So there's a, lot, there's a lot to tease out of what you said. Firstly, I, what I really like hearing is that it helps you get to sleep, but it doesn't help you get to bed. Yeah. Yeah, you've still got to have the psychosocial construct, the support to actually get to bed. So, now, you know, for me, clonidine, I understand clonidine as an alpha-2 receptor uh, um, agonist. So what does that mean? So for me, it means that it, it, it shuts down the, the noradrenergic release from the hypothalamus. So effectively, it switches off the neurological component of 
effectively the flight or fight response. Now, admittedly, there is there is another component from circulating adrenaline, but you know when the mind is active, it's all about the the noradrenergic outflow from from the hypothalamus, and that's also one of the reasons why we use clomidine in addiction medicine because it helps alle- alleviate some of the symptoms of opioid withdrawal, which are also mediated by this noradrenergic output. The other, the so one of the one of the consequences of the use of um, uh, clonidine is, as you say, vasodilation. So not only does it shut down the noradrenergic release, it shuts down the that that internal dialogue associated with with the almost like the, the anxiety. It's very like anxiety. This is this internal dialogue. So clonidine helps with that, but it also, as you say, helps with vasodilation. And we've got to remember that the first half of sleep is all about vasodilation. You cannot fall asleep if you are not peripherally vasodilated because what has to happen with your core body temperature is it has to fall. And the only way that your core will fall is if your peripheries are warm. And the only way that your peripheries get warm is if you are vasodilated, which is why I say you can't sleep with cold feet and you need to wear bed socks. But clonidine is effectively the pharmacological bed socks to a certain extent. <laughs> so what can you say about, so do you remember Stahl? I do remember Stahl. I think I'm getting a, a vivid flashback from medical school for the trauma that is that textbook. <laughs> well, for me, it was a joy to read that textbook. But anyway, one of the things that Stahl talked about was the signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Whereby, you know, a, a, a high signal to noise is when you're tuning a radio and you get a very clear signal with very little background noise, but a low signal to noise ratio is when you turn the knob slightly and you get all this background static, which obliterates the signal and so you can't really hear the radio properly. And so ADHD has been likened to a condition whereby you have a low signal to noise ratio. And style, um, now I'm sure anyone listening will correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my memory of this is that style said that um, stimulants decrease the background noise, whereas alpha-2 agonists, and I'm including in that guanfazine, otherwise known as entunib, and clonidine, they increase the signal. So either way, you are basically augmenting the signal-to-noise ratio, and therefore you're allowing salience. One of the one of the concepts of ADHD is a disorder of, well, you know, is it a disorder of salience? I, I defer to your psychiatric assessment on that. Yeah, oh, definitely. And, you know, it's not just about not being able to focus. It's not about, it's about not being able to weigh up what you need to focus on because there's so much background yeah. noise. So I think that in the theory completely fits with what we're seeing clinically. Yeah, yeah. So what's the, so so we all kind of have a lot of experience using clonidine for various reasons, but the, the new kid on the block is guanfazine. It's, it's also an alpha-2 agonist, otherwise known in, as in tuna, but I, I haven't used it. So what can you tell me about a guanfazine? I haven't used it much either because at the moment with regulations in Australia, it's only PBS indicated for children and um, it's very expensive otherwise. And so it's not really something that um, many people would, be prescribed in the adult setting for sure, um, but it could be yeah. an important adjunct, just as if clonidine is. Um, one important thing about guanfazine, because it's, it is a stimulant, um, if you want a second agent, it's a fantastic um, adjunct because it doesn't contribute to all of the potential side effects that stimulants can. And having it yeah. just before bed means that you're sort of dividing doses of your treatment by 12 hours, which is a lot easier yeah. to maintain. Um, in the pediatric population when they are diagnosed with ADHD. Some people are even having it as a first line because there's good evidence of having a good night's sleep and having that um, adrenergic control at night time makes for less hyperactivity the next day. So mm. the evidence that's coming out in the pediatric population is that the hyperactivity component, um, if that's quelled enough, then someone can be settled enough at school to then do the rest of the work with the supports that they already have without having to put them through um, the sometimes really difficult side effects of, um, mm. of weight loss and dry mouth and anxiety and agitation that can come with Ritalin or other stimulant medications. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not a, as you know, I'm not an expert on guanfazine, but I was told that guanfazine has a longer duration of action than clonidine. Is that is that true? Yeah, because yeah. it's once daily dose at night time. So 
stimulant medications when you take them in the morning, you know, Lizdax amphetamine or long actin Ritalin, they're once daily doses, but the effect kind of tapers out at 4 or 5 p.m. And the idea is that you take them in the morning and you do the activity that you're doing throughout the day, be it school or work, and mm-hmm. after hours, relax, it's out of your system, you don't feel the effect anymore, but you also don't need to be productive. Um, so they're once a day, but they aren't 24 hours a day uh, in mm-hmm. terms of effect. Guanfacine does have the prolonged effect. Not only is the first time you take it, maybe up to 16 hours, but as it builds a steady state up to about five days, um, people do report that round-the-clock reduction in um, yeah. agitation and the most symptoms of ADHD and a building capacity to have a good night's sleep. So it's much longer acting than clonidine because I do know that clonidine's half-life is 12 to 16 hours. So I think that with clonidine, you you know, if you, you can, if at the right dose, get a good night's sleep, which, as we've already discussed, is really vital. Mm. Uh, Talking about sleep, and we've also brought up this issue earlier, we, we talked about this concept of the uh, sleep cycle, the circadian rhythm. I mean, there's another drug that is commonly used yeah. almost to alleviate the potential side effects of ongoing uh, arousal with stimulants, and that's melatonin. Now, what's, what's your view on the role of melatonin in, in this kind of treatment space? Uh, it's pretty effective for someone who definitively has delayed sleep phase disorder. Um, so, you know, if you're sleeping a little bit later and you're not occupied enough during the day, um, that doesn't quite meet the mark. And going to a sleep position and having a proper assessment for delayed sleep phase disorder um, is really important. And if that's true, melatonin in conjunction with lifestyle modification and light box therapy does wonders uh, in order to sort of retrain your brain about the appropriate time to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, so I think as a part of a bigger strategy it's great but only really for a few months while you're doing the other things it's not really uh, something you take every night for a long time Mm. to get good sleep yeah so i mean i I have i have issues with people who say to me i need my kids long-term melatonin please will you prescribe it to me melatonin is actually one of the one of the molecules that in in mammals that have cyclical fertility periods i.e. that are fertile during the spring and summer and infertile during the autumn and the winter. Melatonin is, is actually the hormone that suppresses uh, gonadal function. Mm. The reason why, one of the reasons why we don't, as children, uh, have any kind of sexual function is because the, because where the pineal gland secretes a constant amount of melatonin, right, albeit at night, but that concentration of melatonin compared to body weight ratio that, that is so high during prepubescent life it is sufficiently high to actually suppress gonadal function. So that one of the reasons why we actually experience puberty at the age of 14 is because we're growing and our body mass is increasing and therefore relatively our concentration of melatonin affecting the gonads is reducing. So that's, that's just one thing that I'm thinking about behind my, um, when I'm thinking about melatonin. That, you know, it, it's, it's licensed for the short-term management of sleep phase disorder. So would you give melatonin long-term to someone who's experiencing the side effects of uh, stimulants? No, I, the way I use melatonin and the way I describe it to a patient is I think of this as training wheels for your brain and you've lost the yeah. ability to know when it's light, light and day. Obviously, you know as a person, but the yeah. pineal gland is shooting off some melatonin at a time where it doesn't line up with firstly when the sun is going up and down or when you need yeah. to be productive. So let's yeah. put your pineal gland on a couple of training wheels and teach yeah. it how to appropriately release melatonin. The other things that impact melatonin are not just when you go to sleep, but make sure when the sun's up, you're up, and that involves setting up an alarm. And I don't care if you're really tired, get out of bed and expose yourself to that sun. And the other thing is about making sure you get adequate oral intake in the daylight hours because your gut is a really strong um, factor in appropriate melatonin excretion. So that two or three month period where you have melatonin is prime time to do everything to teach mm. your brain this is when melatonin needs to exist so more than three months i just say we've given it a go um you're still not sleeping let's try something else yeah now you spent you've mentioned a light box and you've also mentioned that you know early morning sun I, i'm a great believer in lifestyle medicine mm. uh, and behavioral approaches as the foundation for any any problem including insomnia and i believe uh that the, the, the key to a good night's sleep actually starts with a morning routine and you know even on an overcast day, the amount of light that is getting to your eye is 10,000 lux, right? 
So even when it's cloudy and drizzly, you know, it's 10,000 lux. And, you know, most light boxes, I think, struggle to consistently give 10,000 lux. Um, so really, if you can get into the sky, if you can look at the sky for 10 minutes, you have set yourself up for a great night's sleep. You've, you've woken yourself up and you've set the alarm clock for your, for your, uh, for your brain to say, right, in 12 to 14 hours, I need to start secreting melatonin to try and get a good night's sleep. So the morning routine is as important as the evening routine in setting you up for a good cycle and a good sleep, especially if you have ADHD. Well put, Phil. And that, that goes for other lifestyle factors like caffeine and uh, yeah. nicotine. As if, if you have that later in the day and you're giving that signal to remain yeah. awake, that's going to push out uh, that circadian rhythm further as well. Yeah. Now, I mean, this actually brings us on to the other idea or one of the important issues that I face that a lot of people, certainly with adult, potentially adult ADHD, they use alcohol and cannabis to self-medicate some of their symptoms, especially the insomnia. But what's, what's your view on the role of these substances in, in self-medicating ADHD? It's common. And often people don't get an appropriate ADHD diagnosis because they're precluded from the assessment while they're in the midst yeah. of a substance use disorder, especially with alcohol and cannabis. Yeah. Um, on the other side, a lot of people with uh, alcohol and cannabis use will have inattentive symptoms because of their alcohol and cannabis use. So it's a very commonly occurring request to either manage someone's substance use disorder when they have ADHD or consider ADHD when they're using alcohol and cannabis. Uh, yeah. But that sleep architecture is just sacrosanct when you have ADHD. Absolutely. Yeah. And anything that you do to alter that is going to have ramifications, not just the next day, but for the next night's sleep and so on and so forth. So making sure you're getting an appropriate amount of REM sleep and going through all of the phases of um, one, two, three, they're really, really important to make sure that your ability to focus when the stocks up, when the odds are stocked against you has mm -hmm. no reason to falter. So I, I really, you know, abstinence, in and of itself can be one treatment for ADHD. And if you're not having an effect from the stimulant medication and lifestyle factors, but still smoking cannabis and drinking alcohol, that's gonna be the, the very obvious thing to get rid of. So I advise people as much as possible, just not to do it, um, mm. especially don't make it a habit. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot overstate the adverse impact of both alcohol and cannabis on REM sleep and all that. It just, as you say, destroys the architecture and therefore just screws you up. Yes. Um, Manu, unfortunately, we've run out of time once again. I really would look forward to speaking with you again very shortly on further the management of ADHD. But for today, thank you. Thanks, Phil. I'll see you then. That's all for today, folks. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong, and this has been Cracking Addiction.